in Psalm 78, verse number 2, David said, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter the dark sayings of old. That was David. And you got to understand that David never spoke in any parable. What David said was something they call messianic prophecy. David was prophesying about the Messiah and the things that he will do when he comes. So in Psalm 78, verse number 2, David said, I will open my mouth in parables. If you don't listen to me, you get confused. Just listen to me, please. In Psalm 78, verse number 2, David said, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter the dark sayings of old. And as I was telling you, David never spoke in any parable. What David did is something they call messianic prophecy. He was prophesying about the Messiah when he comes. So in Matthew chapter 13, verses 43, verses 34 and 35, he says, all these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables. And without a parable, he did not speak to the people that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, talking about David. I will open my mouth in parables. This month, God laid it on my heart to start teaching on Jesus' parables. So I'm titling it, He Opened His Mouth in Parables. And Bob will lead us as we read Luke chapter 10, verses... Hallelujah. Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 36. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Hallelujah. I want you to listen to the reading attentively because we are going to draw vital lessons from them. This parable it is popularly referred to. Will somebody give him another Bible? No, I got it. Okay. No, okay. okay, go ahead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he came to the next man on his own donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Read it. Continue. Well, that was 36. Go to the 37. The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Well, Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Father, in the name of Jesus, even as I bring your word, help me to become a good interpreter of your word, even as I bring it to your people. And help us also to become practitioners of it as we receive it. In the name of Jesus, I take authority and I come against everything that will become a hindrance to prevent your word from coming forth. 
Let your word come and do us good. Let your word come and change us. Let your word come and transform us. Let your word come and make us better people so that we will all be conformed to the image of your dear son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I'm teaching on something I call He Opened His Mouth in Parables, Part 1. Part 1, we want to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. From the context of this parable, a lawyer came to Jesus one day and asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? And then Jesus Christ enlisted the commandments to the lawyer. He said the first commandment is you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strengths. And then Jesus said the second is like unto this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. The lawyer was not satisfied. You know lawyers. He wanted to justify himself the more. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus Christ, wanting to tell the lawyer who our neighbor is, came up with this parable, popularly referred to as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Vital lessons, important lessons we can learn from this first parable. I'm titling the open his mouth in parables. From the parable, we are told that the man was going down. The man was traveling down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And then he fell among thieves. When the thieves met this man, they attacked him. They took his clothes. They beat him and they left him half dead. As the man was half dead on the road, a priest and a Levite passed by. They did not pay attention to this man. And then a Samaritan came along. The Samaritan attended to this man. He bandaged his wound. He poured oil and the wine in his wound. And then attended to him. Then Jesus Christ asked the lawyer and said, Which of these three was a neighbor to the man who was left her there? The lawyer was so ashamed, he couldn't even mention his name that he's a Samaritan. He said, He who showed a paid attention, he who helped him. Then Jesus said, Go and do thou likewise. The first lesson we can learn from this parable is this We are told that a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho Church. I want you to understand that the fact that the man was going down is an indication that he was backsliding. Understand that. He was going down. Remember, he was not going up. Remember, he was not going straight. He was going down. And as a Christian, anytime you are not reading your Bible, it means you are going down. As a Christian, anytime you are not praying, it means you are going down. As a Christian, anytime you are not living a life that is worthy of emulation, it means you are going down. As a Christian, anytime you stop witnessing to people, it means you are going down. When you fail to do the things God wants you to do as a child of God, it presupposes that you are going down. In other versions, we have a man was traveling down. In other versions, we have a man was moving down. Whichever be the case, the man was backsliding. The man was not living right. The man was walking away from it in his relationship with Almighty God. To prove to you that the man was going down, the Bible also says he was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. It means that the journey was from Jerusalem to Jericho. Apart from the fact that it had geographical significance, it also means that the man was traveling down, backsliding. <coughs> the Jerusalem and the Jericho explains it all. For instance, Jerusalem means the presence of God. Jerusalem means the house of God. How about Jericho? Jericho stands for the cursed land. You remember in Joshua chapter 7, when the Israelites conquered Jericho, when they were entering their promised land, the first nation they had to conquer was Jericho. And when Joshua conquered Jericho, the Bible said Joshua pronounced curse on Jericho. Joshua said in Joshua chapter 7, that curse is everybody who will build Jericho. If you have studied the Bible very well, during the reign of Ahab, that king who married Jezebel, 
who adulterated the worship of God in all Israel, sin increased so much in Israel that a man called Hay built Jericho again. But remember Joshua had cursed Jericho. When Hale built Jericho, he slaughtered his firstborn and used his blood as sacrifice and laid it on the foundation when he built Jericho. That was abomination before God. And God had cursed Jericho through Joshua. And this was a man who was traveling, who was moving from Jerusalem, the house of God, to Jericho, the cursed land. That explains why the scripture says a man was going down. Anytime you are going from Jerusalem to Jericho, it stands, it signifies backsliding. It signifies you are not living right. Is somebody understanding me? So although you are sitting here, although you are sitting in your house, you can also be likened to be the guy who was moving down from Jerusalem to Jericho when you don't read your Bible, when you don't pray, when you don't live a life that is worthy of emulation, when you don't do what God expects Christians to do. Anytime you do that, you are not different from the man who was moving down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Is somebody understanding me? When this man was moving down from Jerusalem to Jericho, we are told that he was confronted by thieves. By thieves. Church, I want you to understand. Anytime you are moving from Jerusalem to Jericho, the thief will get you. Why will the thief get you? Remember, Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into them and they are safe. Bible says keep yourselves pure and the wicked one will never have you. Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 that if you, in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, if you break the hedge, the serpent will bite you. Father God has made a hedge over his children. So when you leave Jerusalem to Jericho, you have broken the hedge. The name of the Lord is a strong tower over his children. When you leave Jerusalem to Jericho, it means you are making yourself unprotected. And that was exactly what the man did. And that explains why the thief was able to attack him. Who is the thief in this context? John 10, 10, Jesus said the thief comes not but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Satan is the thief. As long as you remain in God, Satan can never have you. But he's going to have you when you live carelessly, when you walk aimlessly. He's going to have you when you don't see the need to come to church always. So when we want you to come to church, we want to help you to build your relationship with God. We want to help you to fortify your security in God so the enemy will not have you. So when you come to church, you are not doing somebody a favor. You are helping yourself so you won't leave Jerusalem and go to Jericho. On the road from Jerusalem to Jericho church, it is a dangerous road. It is a dangerous road because the thief is there. It is a dangerous road because the enemy is there. Satan is always out there to kill, to steal, and to destroy. As I'm talking to you now, I can tell several people are wounded, several people are hurt, several people are bruised, several people are killed, several people have lost their properties, they are destroyed because on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, they encountered Satan. And he's not merciful. He is not considerate. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, I want you to understand, the devil is your adversary. <laughs> Another word for adversary is your opposer, your enemy, the one who wants to destroy you. Your adversary, the devil, is walking about, seeking whom he may devour. And church, the only time he can devour you is when you make a mistake by traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. The only time Satan can get you is when you are leaving Jerusalem on the way to Jericho. And that is why you should remain in the house of God. Obadiah verses 17 says, listen, upon Mount Zion, which is in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. So as long as you are in Jerusalem, definitely there will be deliverance for you. It doesn't matter how long it will take. Are you sick? Are you believing God for financial breakthrough? Is there something on your heart you want God to do for you? In Jerusalem, the Bible says there will be deliverance. And then there will be holiness. 
God will turn your situation around. It doesn't matter how sinful you think you are. It doesn't matter how weak you feel in your relationship with God. As long as you remain in Jerusalem and you keep on hearing the word of God and as we pray together, the word of God will change you and your life will turn around. So you end up becoming holy. And then the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. You'll be able to get the things that you want to get. You'll be able to get the blessings that God has for your life will come to pass only in Jerusalem. So that's why you don't have to leave Jerusalem. You have no idea the harm you are causing to yourself when you leave Jerusalem. That's why David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. In Jerusalem, is the house of the Lord. Jerusalem in this context represents the house of the Lord. So stay in the house of God no matter what. Never you walk away from the house of the Lord. When you walk away from the house of the Lord to Jerusalem, church, there will be problems for you. There will be difficulties and challenges for you. You will meet the devil on the way. Is somebody understanding me? Again, you got to understand that in this parable, when the thieves confronted a man, the first thing they did was that they took away his garments. It is not normal when a thief meet you and take your garment. What the thief want to do is maybe get your watch or maybe get something valuable, your wallet or your packables. But in the parable, the first thing the thief did was to take the man's garment away from him. What does that mean? I want you to understand every Christian is wearing a garment of righteousness. Every Christian. You are described as wearing a garment of righteousness. But for the devil to be able to attack you, he want to take that garment away from you first. Remember Adam and Eve, when they sinned, instantly, they realized they were naked. So they went to make themselves aprons to cover themselves. Because their garment of righteousness was attacked. It became tainted. Before the Bible described them in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 25, it said the man and his wife were naked and they were not ashamed because they were covered by the righteousness of God. But the moment they sinned, for the first time they realized they were naked. The devil took away their garment of righteousness. I want you to understand, when you stop coming to church, when you stop doing spiritual things, the devil first thing he will do by attacking you is to take away your garment of righteousness. You don't walk in righteousness anymore. Then you start living in sin. And that is when your problems will begin to compound. Sin will always release the ability of the enemy over your life. And the only way you can overcome that is when you stay in the house of God. As long as you stay in the house of God, there is no way the enemy can take away your garment of righteousness. Amen. Even when you don't have money, still go to church. Even when you are sick, still go to church. It beats my understanding when people say, well, I don't feel good, so I want to stay home. When people don't feel good, they play they want to go in the hospital. So spiritually, if you don't feel good, the best place to be is church. Because in the church, you hear the word of God that will do you good. In the church, you have an encounter with Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ will do you good. So for your own good, whether you have money or no money, for your own good, whether things are working or things are not working, the best place you want to find yourself is the house of God. Because in the house of God, revelations are always given. In the house of God, the best ideas are born. In the house of God, God will give you information. David said in Psalm 27, verse number 4, he said, one thing, one thing. He said one thing. He said, one thing have I desired in my life, in my heart, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Again, he said, them that are planted in the house of the Lord, they shall flourish in the court of our God. Do you want to flourish? Then be planted. But when you are deeply planted, nothing can uproot you. When you are not planted in the house of God, that is when you can easily want to move from Jerusalem to Jericho. And then your problems will compound. When you are planted in the house of God, it doesn't matter difficulties and challenges that comes your way. You want to stay in the house of God. I'm quickly reminded of Naomi and the husband Ahimelech. It hurts me when I read about them and how Naomi didn't understand the things of God. They were living in Bethlehem, Judah. 
Bethlehem Judah Church being the house of God, the presence of God. And there was severe hunger in the presence of God in Bethlehem Judah. So you know what they did? They left Bethlehem Judah to Moab. My goodness. How can you leave Bethlehem Judah to Moab? Moab means cursed land. Do you know why Moab means cursed? During Lot's time, you remember Lot and his two daughters ran to Mount Zor. And when they went to Mount Zor, they were living there. And what happened was this. The daughters slept. One of the daughters slept with the father. And the, she became pregnant. When the father woke up, he didn't like it. So he cursed the daughter because she made the father drunk. And the child was born and he was named Moab. He grew up to form the nation Moab. So he was cursed, his nation was cursed. So how can you leave the presence of God because of hunger to the cursed land? Church, I keep on telling you, gold glitters, but not everything that glitters is gold. And that's why you've got to be very careful. Sometimes things may be difficult for you where you are. It doesn't mean you have to move, just see God's face. When they went to Moab, she lost the husband in a, in a war. Her two sons also died. When she was coming back to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, Judah, the woman went to meet her. They said, Naomi is back. Naomi is back. She said, don't call me Naomi. Call me something else. I left her full. I'm coming back hand empty. The Lord has dealt with me bitterly. The Lord did not deal with her bitterly. She dealt with herself bitterly because she didn't see God's face. I want to challenge you the importance of prayerful decision in everything that you do. So that you don't end up in Moab. You don't end up in Jericho. Because if you leave the house of God there, there will be problems for you. If you stay put, God will slowly but surely turn your situations around. I keep on telling you, sometimes God will allow problems and difficulties to come your way. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It doesn't mean he doesn't care. It is an opportunity to test your faith so you'll be promoted. So in Jerusalem, we are not too sure why this gentleman was leaving Jerusalem to Jericho. But it could be that maybe things were not working for him there. It could be that there were challenges and difficulties there. It could be that he was going through crisis. It doesn't matter the situation you find yourself. Always stay put in the house of God. That is the sure way you will be blessed. So in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 25, Bible says, do not neglect the assembling of ourselves together, as it is the manner of some people. Some people don't like going to church. They think church is just a place of socializing, so they can go today and next time they will not go. Those people, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 was written for them. He said, do not neglect the assembling of ourselves together, as it is the manner of some people. But keep on going, encouraging one another as you see the day of Christ approaching. Hebrews 3.13 It says, exhort one another day, whilst it is called today, lest any one of you be drawn through the deceitfulness of sin. So when you come to church, we exhort one another daily. If you don't come to church to be inspired, you end up becoming inspired. And you don't want that. To avoid inspiration, come to be inspired at all times. Hallelujah. Amen. So this man left Jerusalem to Jericho. And in Jericho, <laughs> on the way to Jericho, he had problems. The Satan attacked him, took away his garment of righteousness, and they left him half dead. Half dead. <coughs> in the parable, a priest was passing by. The priest did not pay him any attention. The Levite did not pay him any attention, but the Samaritan, it is interesting that it was the Samaritan who attended to this man. Who was the Samaritan? You got to understand that the lawyer could not even say it was the Samaritan. When Jesus asked the question, which of the three was a neighbor to the man who was half dead, the lawyer couldn't say it was the Samaritan. You know why? Because the lawyer was a Jew, and the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. The Jews had no talking terms with the Samaritans. Just for recap, let me remind you, I've told you this before, why the Jews and the Samaritans were not in talking terms. According to history, in the years 721 and 722 BC, there was a king of Assyria 
caught uh, Gapilasin, son of Shamanasa II. This king attacked Israel, conquered Israel, and brought so many Assyrians into Israel, and then took many people from Israel to Assyria. History tells us that they intermarried, and their product became known as Samaritans. So a Samaritan is a Jew with a mixed blood. Either the father is from Israel, and the mother is from Assyria, or vice versa. So eventually, when the Jews were in their land, they were looking down upon the Samaritans because they were half-blooded Jews. And the Samaritans were not happy that the Jews were looking down upon them. Because they were not full-blooded Jews, the Jews would not allow the Samaritans to be in the temple, to go to the synagogue. At that time, they wouldn't even let them to be in the place where the scroll is being read. So the Samaritans have bought bitterness in their hearts against the Jews. They were not in talking terms. They were like enemies. They were living like next door neighbors. And they were not in talking terms. That explains why Jesus Christ wanted to pass through Samaria and the Samaritans would not allow them. And his disciples were mad. They said, why won't you allow us to command fire from heaven to consume these Samaritans? At that time, Jesus Christ was with a Samaritan woman on the well and he asked the woman water. The woman said, if you are a really a Jewish rabbi, you should know better that the Jews and the Samaritans had no dealings. We have no talking terms. So the Jews and the Samaritans, they were not talking. But then when a Jew was in crisis and even a priest and Levites, all bypassing him, it was a Samaritan who attended to him. You have no idea the kind of people God is going to use them to help you. So don't you despise anybody. Today that person may have nothing, but tomorrow he might end up becoming a savior to you. So if you have the opportunity today to bless somebody, go ahead and do it. If you have an opportunity today to become a blessing to somebody, go ahead and do it. You don't know, tomorrow things might turn around and that person is also going to become a blessing to you. That person is going to be a blessing to your family. That person's family are going to be a blessing to your family. The problem with many of us is we want to be identified with only them that are making it. So even though we have, when somebody is in crisis, all that we need to do just maybe share an idea with the person. Or maybe God has blessed us, we can also bless that person. We don't want to do it. But you got to understand, you are a possessor of nothing. You are a custodian of everything that you have. So everything that God has given to you, he has given to you so that you become a blessing to other people. Share your ideas with people. Share your money with people. Share your time with people. Everything that God has given to you, you are a steward. Share it with people. And as you do, God is going to bless you more. This is what the Samaritan was willing to do. So when he met this Jewish guy who was half wounded, he quickly forgot about the fact that we had no dealing terms. We had no talking terms. He decided to make his hand dirty and help the Jew. The first thing that he did is that he applied the oil and the wine. The oil and the wine. When you have soul, and oil and wine is put in the soul, it burns. You feel pain, but it heals. The oil and the wine in this context represent the word of God. Church, more often than not, when the word of God is coming, it will come to hit us at a point where we are not living up to expectation. So you have a choice. A choice to accept what the word teaches you or reject the word. Many of us, when we hear the word of God coming to us, instead of us to humbly, obediently take the word, we become angry. We say, oh, he's preaching about me. He's talking about me. I'll never go to church again. I'll never listen to him again. If you do that, you are causing more harm to yourself. In Acts chapter 7, verse number 51, Philip was preaching and he told the Jews, he said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Why do you always resist the Holy Ghost? As your father did, so do you. The sin of resisting the Holy Spirit is this. You hear the word of God coming to you. You know there is a place you are not living right. 
you know you are not doing what you are supposed to do. God through the servant is breaking the word to you. All that you need to do is to change, repent, but you are refusing to take the word. When you do that, you are resisting the Holy Spirit. Is somebody understanding me? And how long can you continue to resist the Holy Spirit? So anytime the oil and the wine is poured in your life, in your womb, it is painful initially. But if you allow it, it will heal you. In other words, if you take the word of God and do what the word of God is asking you to do, that is when it will give you long life. That is when it will give you health. That is when it will turn your financial situation around. That is when you can have hope and live again. So when you hear the word of God, don't you resist it. Is somebody understanding me? The oil and the wine church is good for all of us. In every situation we find ourselves, when the oil and the wine is presented to us, let us ask ourselves, where am I faulting? Where am I not living up to expectation? Why is God breaking this word to me? And obediently, let us take it, let us apply it to our lives. As we do that, it will help us and it will change us. But if we refuse to do it, then we are causing more harm to ourselves. Let me give you this realistic example, a story I learned long time ago, which is applicable to what I'm saying. Do you know China, they are the leading producer of rice in the world, and they love rice. There is this gentleman, every day, breakfast, he will eat rice porridge. In the afternoon, he will eat rice balls for lunch. In the evening, he will eat maybe fried rice. Every time rice, he will eat rice always. Apart from rice, he wouldn't eat any other thing. Listen to me attentively. It so happened that he came to the United States. He had never seen microscope before. So for the first time in his life, he saw microscope in the US. And he was thrilled for what microscope could do. Because in China those days, they were not having a microscope. The microscope could see living animal particles you can't see with your natural eyes. So that thrilled him, that excited him. Things that the natural eyes couldn't see, the microscope could see, so he bought it. And he was very excited. Everywhere he would be, he would use the microscope to look into things. And he said, wow, what a discovery. He loved the microscope. So when he went to China, one morning he was coming to eat his rice porridge. Then he picked the microscope. As he looked into the rice porridge with the microscope, there were so many gems in the rice porridge. He was shocked because he has eaten this all along in his life. But for the first time, the microscope will tell him that the food you are eating, there are gems in it. You don't believe what he did. He trashed the rice porridge. He didn't eat it. Then, lunchtime, when the rice balls were served, as he was about to eat, he picked the microscope again. He looked into the rice balls and he couldn't believe it. There were several gems in the rice balls again. So he didn't eat. <laughs> Dinner time, the same. <laughs> Then the man said, how come I didn't know I was eating gems all along? Now the microscope has helped him to discover that he was eating gems in the food that he cherished most. So he had a choice. A choice to either stop eating the Chinese rice and eat something else or neglect the warning from the microscope and keep on eating the rice. Unfortunately, he broke the microscope. He became, he became very angry. He destroyed the microscope. Because the microscope helped him for the first time to see a problem associated to him that he didn't know before. And many, 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 many of us, you might be laughing, but we are behaving just like this man. The word of God will always throw more light in your life to let you see and know the things that you are doing wrong. And in the process, church, you have a choice. A choice to obediently take the word of God and change or ignore the word of God to your own detriment. Hallelujah. I pray for you that you will not be like this Chinese, but instead you take the word of God, allow the word of God to work in your life so that your wounds will be healed. Amen. Amen. <laughs> 
So in conclusion, the reason why this man was attacked is because he was leaving Jerusalem to Jericho. And as long as you don't stay in Jerusalem, Satan will attack you. When Satan attacks you, the first thing you want to do is to take away your righteousness. It's to let you walk in sin. Anytime you start walking in sin, anytime you start telling lies, anytime you start doing the things that you are not supposed to do as a Christian, remember that Satan is slowly taking away your garment of righteousness. It is only when your garment of righteousness is taken, that is when you become no match for Satan. Shall we pray? Hallelujah.